A Fed chair speaks, a president delivers his blueprint for the next two years, earnings roll in, but a tragedy in Turkey overshadows them all. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard on whether we're headed for a landing at all, soft or hard. I think the Fed understands that it doesn't understand. Stephen Meyer, the man responsible for New York City pension funds, on investing for the long term in this uncertain market. There's a lot of things to consider out there, the risk of a recession here and abroad. And Josh Bolton of the Business Roundtable on what the president's State of the Union message means for American business. You won't find a single member of the Business Roundtable saying, please put me in a completely unregulated environment. There was a lot for Global Wall Street to pay attention to this week, but the tragedy of the earthquakes in southeastern Turkey cast a shadow over it all, as the death toll reached into the tens of thousands and the difficulties of reaching those in need seemed almost insurmountable. But even as the world came to terms with human disaster, we also focused on the economy and inflation. When Fed Chair Jay Powell talked with Bloomberg's David Rubenstein about the latest jobs numbers and whether they changed his mind on further rate hikes. This process is likely to take quite a bit of time. Uh, it's not going to be, uh, we don't think, smooth. It's probably going to be bumpy. President Biden delivered his annual State of the Union address and called for bipartisanship even over the catcalls from Republicans on things like the border. Congress must restore the right and the... And energy policy. I said, we're going to need oil for at least another decade, and that's going to exceed <laughs> and beyond that. The fallout from that Chinese spy balloon continued with questions about whether, if it was a Chinese test of U.S. defenses, the U.S. passed that test. They wanted a display of weakness, and I think to some extent they got that. I don't know why this wasn't shot down prior to it entering U.S. airspace. Earnings continued to pour in, with Disney surprising the upside on earnings, the downside on subscribers, and newly returned CEO Bob Iger announcing a major restructuring and the trimming of thousands of jobs. We will aggressively curate our general entertainment content. We will reassess all markets we have launched in and also determine the right balance between global and local content. The markets reacted to all this by being all over the place. The S&P 500 started out lower on Monday, spiked up after Powell's talk on Tuesday, only to come back down to earth on Friday, ending the week down just over 1%. The Nasdaq had a tougher time of it. It, too, shot up on Tuesday, but settled for the week down 2.4%, while the yield on the 10-year rose more steadily through the week, starting out at 3.55% and ending up just over 3.7%. To help us sort it all out, we welcome now Christina Hooper. She's Invesco Chief Global Market Strategist and Joanne Feeney, Partner in Advisors Capital Management. Welcome back to both of you. Great to have you here. Joanne, let me start you with, with you, if I could. Uh, did the markets get a little bit more sober by the end of the week? They seemed a little euphoric after Tuesday. Yeah, David, I think that's exactly what we saw. Uh, you know, the Fed has had a hard time convincing the markets that there's a lot more work to be done to bring down inflation. You know, and they need to understand, the market needs to understand that if rates are going to go higher and they're likely to stay higher through the year. We're almost there in terms of the market's forecast. They do still expect one rate cut at the end of the year. But, you know, that is uh, quite a different position to be in relative to the beginning of last year, where we saw many rate hikes. So there's certainly less of a headwind this year from further rate hikes. But we're also not likely to get that break that the market is hoping for any time this year. Well, Christina, what about it? Is, is the market slowly giving up on that break lower in, later in the year? We had been told the market's saying, you know, we're going to have a cut by the end of the year. It looks like they're not so sure of that anymore. Well, hopefully um, they get accustomed to that idea because I don't think we're going to see a cut by the end of this year. Um, the economy is in better shape than I think most anticipated. So there really isn't a reason for the Fed to cut rates later this year. Something would have to go um, very wrong um, for the Fed to need to cut rates by the end of the year. It looks like it's going to be a softish landing. So, so, so Joanna, what about the economy looking stronger? Can we talk about the economy? Because you talk about different parts of the economy, you get different results. I mean, look at housing, it doesn't look that strong at all. And some people this week were talking about a so-called rolling recession. I know that's something you take issue with. 
Well, yeah, we're certainly seeing some parts of the economy in contraction. Housing, as you pointed out, certain parts of the technology sector where we've heard about lots of layoffs, uh, shrinking PC uh, production, significantly down year over year. So there's certainly parts of the economy that are suffering contraction, but there are also parts of the economy that continue to expand. And when you look at the aggregate of what consumers have to work with in terms of spending power, we have seen real disposable income rise for the last six months. So consumers still have more to work with, and I think that's why we're continuing to see relatively robust numbers in terms of, of spending. Yeah, Joanne, this is an important point you made to me. I want to make sure we unpack it, which is we have a tendency to take a look at wages, and we say real wages have not gone up, they've even gone down, uh, and that's for individuals. But if you look at the additional people coming to the workforce, you can have the aggregate actually going up, which says something strong about the economy. Yeah, that's exactly right. And in fact, if you look more granularly at the data, in fact, over the last few months, we're seeing an increase in real wages as well. So you combine that with more people in the workforce, that gives a lot of support for consumer spending. Now, it doesn't mean that a recession may not be coming at some point in the future. High interest rates are clearly an impediment to economic activity, whether it's firms investing or households borrowing for the next car or, or, or to buy the next house. So we're by no means sanguine that the recession threat is over. But we do see continued strength, for now at least, from the consumer side. Well, the consumers, as you know, Christina, is all what it's all about. What is it, something like 70 percent of the economy, something like that, is consumer. So what is the state of the consumer as far as you can tell? Well, I think the consumer is in fairly good shape. Um, what we see, of course, is an incredibly tight labor market. That's a problem, perhaps, for the Fed in terms of its concerns about inflation. But it's, it's a wonderful thing to have um, when you have rates going up, right? You have so many people employed. Um, yes, they've come under some pressure in different areas because of the rate hikes. Um, but in general, people can still afford to go out and shop. And so it's a very different environment than what we saw um, when, when the Fed was, was hiking rates and, and unemployment was higher. I mean, this is a very, very um, appealing labor market that leads to a fundamentally sound consumer uh, in general. Fundamentally sound. Let's go back on that, Christina, yeah. if we could just for a moment, because going into this, there was a lot of so-called dry powder in households. They had a lot of savings they could spend down. They're spending that down. We're starting to see credit card balances go up. At the same time, rates are going up. At one point, does that put some constraints on the consumer? Well, it's certainly going to put constraints on the consumer, but we have to look at it in the context of pre-pandemic conditions. Savings are still higher than they were pre-pandemic, but they may have gotten low enough that they have encouraged greater labor force participation, right? So, so we've certainly seen some positive news there. And, and so in general, what I think is, is that this is an environment in which there are, um, there are many consumers um, that have the ability to spend. Um, certainly, inflation has been something of a headwind, but it's, it's, um, and it, it hasn't certainly been cured yet, but the outlook on inflation is, has improved. Certainly, the Michigan flash uh, uh, inflation expectations today, the five-year ahead remains at 2.9%. So they're very well anchored. I think the consumer's feeling good. Sentiment has gone up. Um, and they're, they're outspending. They, many feel very secure in their jobs, especially lower-income Americans. Joanne, all, so much of this depends, obviously, on what the Fed thinks, not what we think, what the Fed thinks. So what do you think the Fed is looking at? What will it look at as it ties, decides whether to keep moving up and how far to keep moving up and how long to hold it up there? Well, you know, David, the Fed's made it pretty clear that they're really focused on a, a persistent source of inflation, which could be coming through wages. And so nominal wages are still rising. They look also at the uh, ECI, the Employment Cost uh, Compensation Index, which gives you a, a much more accurate view of what's really going on in terms of compensation. So they're concerned that that's continuing to rise at a decent clip and that that could feed into inflation. They're seeing inflation still in their super core measure, that is services excluding housing. And so they're going to watch that really carefully. And that's why when they say they're data dependent, that's really what it means. If they see that start to slow down, then I think everybody can breathe a bit of a sigh of relief. But right now, right, we're still seeing a lot of demand for services that are keeping that inflation pretty robust. At the same time, we're seeing more labor flow into the services sector. So if you think to the fundamentals of inflation, it was all about shortages of supply. Now we're starting to see supply rolling back through into services. That could help the Fed solve this problem. But that's what they're going to be watching. Christina, there's a lot of talk about plateauing or holding at some point. Maybe not quite yet, but after maybe a couple more rate hikes. 
What if that's not enough? I mean, we know there's long and variable lags for monetary policy. What if, in fact, inflation does not come in? How dangerous is it is if the Fed levels off and then resumes hiking because inflation comes back? Well, that's the concern, right? That's the ghost of Paul Volcker, is that if you don't extinguish every ember of inflation, it could come back um, and and uh, fan the flames of, of higher inflation. Um, however, I think we can take a page from the Bank of Canada's playbook. Uh, they announced recently that they would have a conditional pause. So they're going to be very, very data dependent, watching the economic data and inflation data like hawks. And I think that that could be a model for the Fed. Um, that means that if anything is concerning, they can move right back into action and markets know that that is hanging over them. Well, that's interesting. What do you think of that, Joanne? Would that, would that take care of the problem for the market so they wouldn't react too adversely if they had to hike some more? Oh, I think the market still would really like to see the Fed cut. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if they signal, if they say, okay, we're, we're done for now, and, and they'll always say they're data dependent, I think the market might grow a little bit too enthusiastic, and then if the Fed does turn around some months later and, and say, oh, sorry, we, we still have to raise rates some more, there'll be one of these resets again. So I think we're in for a year of volatility, uh, both because of what the Fed is doing and the larger risks that the world economy is still in the middle of, whether it's the war, energy, price, and, and supply dynamics. I just think it's a it's a tough year heading heading through this because of this ongoing recession risk and the unknowns about rate increases. Thank you so much to Christina Hooper and Joanne Feeney. They're going to be staying with us as we turn to questions of asset allocation in this, as Joanne just said, very uncertain market. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Actually, it turned out to be a remarkably good week for the president. His approval ratings have never been higher, suggesting that if only two or three more scandals can break between now and Washington's birthday, he'll have every American behind him. His State of the Union address, which began with a plea for fiscal responsibility and continued with an extensive laundry list of brand new ways to extend governmental power and spending, seems to have played beautifully in Peoria, not to mention Poughkeepsie and Palm Springs. That was Louis Ruckheiser with his firm and his tongue firmly in his cheek on Wall Street Week back in January 1998. You may remember that was the week after the Monica Lewinsky scandal broke. That's what he's talking about with another presidential scandal. Titanic was the number one movie that week, and the number one song was Together Again by Janet Jackson. Still with us are Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital Management and Christina Hooper of Vesco. Christina, let me start with you, because we've just talked about what we think is going on with the Fed, what's going on with the economy. How do you put together a portfolio? How do you allocate your assets in this world? Well, first, David, I have to answer the question I keep getting asked, which is, is the 60-40 portfolio still alive? And I think to a certain extent, it very much is. The concept of diversification is so important, and I think we will see the benefits of it this year. And actually, not just equities and fixed income, but some alts in there as well to provide um, um, lower correlating assets. Um, I, my view is... As with Joanne, um, I believe we're going to see a significant amount of volatility, especially in the first half of this year. There's just an awful lot of uncertainty. So we're going to want to have uh, exposure to fixed income and some dividend-paying stocks. Uh, we need that income to stabilize as we move up and down. Um, I also believe uh, that, that as we move further into the year, we're likely to see markets start to discount an economic recovery. And so that would be a time to start to perhaps increase equity allocations, especially among the more cyclical parts of the stock market. But fixed income looks attractive, especially investment grade. Munis, um, those are, are very attractive yields right now. I like to think of this as almost a golden age of fixed income. Um, so, so that's a, an important component of portfolios right now. Joanna, what do you think? I mean, that sounds like a fairly diversified approach, but with an emphasis on getting some cash, whether it's from dividends or otherwise. Yeah, we offer a range of opportunities. It really depends on the client, on the investor, and what their time horizon is. You know, at, at this point, there are certainly some opportunities in the market that if you're a long-term investor, you can be all in on equities. But you know, a lot of our clients are also looking for 
that cash flow. And so, you know, we like to offer them choices, a mixture of stocks that will appreciate versus stocks that will deliver uh, that yield alongside a fixed income. And let the, the client really decide, you know, how much they want to put into equities at this point based on their time horizon and their risk. But yeah, I mean, I agree, given the volatility that we've just talked about, this is an awfully good time for a balanced strategy to protect the, uh, the principal in the portfolio. And hopefully, if you can get enough of uh, yield on the dividend side and also on the fixed income side, you, know, you can eat your cash flow to pay your expenses if you're in retirement. And that will save you from having to sell stocks when the market does go down, which inevitably it, it's likely to do along this very bumpy road to get beyond this inflation period. Joanne, do you take a look at what got beaten up the worst last year? And last year was a tough year for both stocks and, and bonds, right? But do you look at things like tech, for example, which really took it on the chin in part because of the discount rate, right? Because they were raising rates and say, you know what? I think they've, had, they've taken their hit. They might come back this year. Yeah, when you look at the tech space, two things happen, right? Certainly what you said, David, you know, the, the interest rates went up and they started going up in November of 21 and tech stocks started coming down. Uh, but the second thing that happened, you know, in retrospect, we can see this, is there were some folks uh, astute enough to recognize that growth of these big tech companies was going to be slower, at least for a short period of time. And if you have enough short-term investors, the hedge funds and whatnot, they're going to get out during this period. And that's what we saw. We do think that was a big headwind for a lot of these stocks. This year, you have far fewer rate increases coming than we saw last year, less of a headwind for those tech stocks. And we believe that towards the second half of the year, and investors are going to start looking now, as we believe they did in January, we should see those growth numbers start to turn around again, and then particularly more so in, in 2024. So we do think it's a good opportunity to pick and choose among the tech stocks, find the good valuations relative to their growth opportunity. And if you're a long-term investor, this is a good time to, to put some of that in your portfolio. Christina, what about you? As, as Joanna just said, it can't be the case we're going to have as many rate hikes this year as we did last year, I don't think at least. Uh, so what does that mean? Certainly it says something about bonds, but beyond that, what does it tell you about, as an investor? I do think that it, it gives certainly um, some space to technology, right? The, the tech sector is likely to, to start to see better performance, uh, especially as, as rates come down. Um, but I also believe that what it really does is clear the way for an economic recovery, right? That once we have a stabilization um, uh, of, of uh, rates, um, that is really when the economy can start to recover, accelerate, and I think stocks are going to anticipate that. So, so we're likely to see smaller caps perform well. I also think the dollar is going to be relatively weak this year. That's a trend that's going to continue. So emerging markets equities, especially Asia EM, we haven't even talked about the China reopening, but that is going to be really powerful for Asia EM. Well, what about Joanne briefly here at the end? Strong bounce back do you think this year? In the overall stock market yeah. I think the I think the jury is still out on that. Uh, you know it looks pretty good from the consumer side. Fewer rate increases is a good thing uh, but ultimately we do have a pretty substantial decline in certain sectors of this economy. We have to see if housing comes back. So I, I think it's uh, yeah. it's an open question. That's why we are counseling. Yeah to really yep. diversify and, and be prepared for volatility. Sounds wise. Thank you so much to Christina Hooper of Invesco and Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital Management. Coming up, long-term investing when people's retirement is on the line. We talk with the man responsible for the New York City pension plans, Stephen Meyer. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We welcome now a big time, serious, long term investor, and he is Stephen Meyer. He is the chief investment officer for the New York City Retirement System. Welcome. It's great to have you here, Stephen. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. So, you've got a big responsibility $250 billion, 750,000 people, depending on this. We've got firemen, policemen, teachers for their pensions. Tell us about the investment climate as you see it today. It's a bit different than it was just two or three years ago, given where we are with interest rates, inflation, growth. Yeah, well, David, I think it's going to be another challenging year in 2023 for uh, the U.S. economy and financial markets. Uh, as a long-term investor, we tend to look less at the fluctuations, short-term fluctuations in asset prices. Uh, we have diversified portfolios that actually are geared to weather all different markets. Uh, my hope and expectation is for the global economy to, you know, for growth to um, uh, bottom out this year. 
uh, and inflation has started to decline more meaningfully. Uh, we have inflation coming down in the States, uh, less so in Europe at this point. You know, there's a lot of things to consider out there. Uh, we look at um, the risk of recession here and abroad. Uh, we're coming off of the, one of the most aggressive interest rate hike cycles uh, that we've seen by the Fed in 40 years. Um, you know that monetary policy operates with a long and variable lag. So we really haven't seen the impact of those rate hikes yet. Uh, and those rate hikes continue. The Fed hiked 25 basis points earlier this month. They've hinted that they're probably going to do another two. And that's what Fed fund futures are pricing in. Um, we also, as I said, inflation abroad is still sticky on the upside. I also think there's a heightened level of geopolitical risk to consider. Uh, the war, uh, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine is problematic. We worry about that escalating. And I do think from a longer term perspective, the dynamic between the U.S. and China and the relationship, I think, will have uh, uh, implications for growth, uh, competition, asset allocation for uh, years to come. So, Stephen, you have the luxury of a long-term perspective. On the other hand, you have to have the money when the pensioners need the money. It's a practical matter. You have to generate returns. 2022, as you say, was a rough year. You, we had stocks and bonds both down. It's a practical matter. What does that tell you as an asset allocator about stocks, bonds, and maybe the alternative to the above? So stock and bonds, you know, it's rare that they go down in tandem, but it's not unprecedented. And you're right, David. Last year was a tough year. We had... That traditional 60-40 equity fixed income bond split generated a negative return of 16%. Uh, that's painful for all manner of investor. Um, we do, again, look on a long-term horizon. We want that balanced portfolio. But you're absolutely right. We had the, the offset, if you will, of uh, private assets. We have about a 20-22% allocation into private assets uh, spanning uh, private equity, private credit, uh, infrastructure, core and non-core real estate, as well as hedge funds. So we do have those offsets that, that, that can help drive that performance, uh, irrespective of what happens in the public markets. You said 20, 22%. You've had a cap of 25%, as I understand it. That's yes. now been raised to 35% by the governor, yeah. Kathy Hochul. Do you expect to use a lot of that uh, increased cap? Well, that's a wonderful question. So I, you know, the new legislation was signed into law by the governor at the mm -hmm. end of the year. Uh, and it definitely will give us an expanded opportunity set. We'll be able to have a, a, a more optimal portfolio. Uh, my expectation is, you know, we're going to start the process of reviewing our strategic asset allocations with the five uh, plan trustees and their consultants, um, hoping to wrap that work up by, say, October, and then perhaps if there is a change in strategy, that'll be implemented in 2024 and beyond. Uh, besides the liquidity issue, what are the transparency issue? Because when you have marketable securities, you know what their va value yeah. is reasonably. With a lot of the private assets, we're not so sure. I mean, do you mark to market, for example, your investments? We do mark to market. We rely on the general partners that we choose to work with uh, to mark the, mark the uh, positions to market. Those marks tend to be pretty conservative. So when the equity markets are rallying, say in private equity, those marks aren't quite as high as the, as the public markets go. Similarly, on the downside, they're, they're, they're not less likely to decline uh, as, as much as public markets. So we do do that. That's a great question. You do worry about transparency, the opaqueness. Um, it's also less regulated, um, although I know that the SEC and others are taking a closer look at it. We try to focus on picking those high performance, um, high conviction managers that can perform over time. So given our size and our footprint in the market, we really have a, a wonderful opportunity to deal with the, the biggest and the best that are out there. Stephen, it's really great to have you here on Wall Street Week. Thank you so much for great. joining us. That's Stephen Meyer. He's the chief investment officer for the New York City Retirement System. And coming up on Wall Street Week, what did the State of the Union address mean for American business? We're going to talk with Josh Bolton, the head of the Business Roundtable. That's coming up on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. The State of the Union Address, when the U.S. President stands before Congress and the world and lays out his hopes and dreams, covering everything from foreign policy. If China threatens our sovereignty, we will act to protect our country, and we did. To public health crises. Two years ago, COVID had shut down, our businesses were closed, our schools were robbed of so much, and today, COVID no longer controls our lives. But the business community and financial markets listen particularly for what he'll say about economic policy. 
and this week's speech had a lot about the economy, addressing the threat of inflation. Here at home, inflation is coming down. Here at home, gas prices are down $1.50 from their peak. Food inflation is coming down, not fast enough, but coming down. Proposing strong new Buy America requirements. Past administrations, Democrat and Republican, have fought to get around it. Not anymore. Tonight, I'm announcing new standards require all construction materials used in federal infrastructure projects to be made in America. Increasing the surtax on stock buybacks. Corporations ought to do the right thing. That's why I propose we quadruple the tax on corporate stock buybacks and encourage long, long-term investments. Demanding oil companies increase production. Have you noticed Big Oil just reported its record profits? Last year they made $200 billion in the midst of a global energy crisis. I think it's outrageous. And in the end, urging bipartisanship, even as Republicans in the chamber were very vocal in their objections. Time and again, Democrats and Republicans came together, came together to defend a stronger and safer Europe. It came together to pass once in a generation infrastructure law, building bridges connecting our nation and our people. And now we turn to somebody who really literally every day sits at that intersection of business on the one hand and government on the other, and he is Josh Bolton. He's the CEO of the Business Roundtable. Josh, thank you so much for being back with us. We heard the State of the Union address. There was a lot covered in there. I'm particularly interested in things that are of import to the business community that you know so terribly well. But let me start with one that we talk about a lot at Bloomberg. You can tell me whether we should, and that's the debt ceiling. Uh, we had the president say we're not going to default on our debt. That's reassuring. At the same time, you've been through a couple of these. Are we going to get this thing resolved before we get to the edge of the precipice? Um, everybody's keeping their fingers crossed that it will be resolved. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of brinksmanship involved here that's, uh, that's not constructive, but it would be a devastating blow to the economy uh, for the first time in our history to allow the debt ceiling to be breached. The members of the Business Roundtable care deeply about it because they know what a big blow it would be. They're not panicked about it because everybody in Washington is telling them, don't worry, we'll work it out. Uh, the nervousness is that uh, nobody at this point can quite define exactly what the path to working it out is likely to be. Uh, Josh, as you know, one of the things the president addressed and uh, got a little bit of a pushback from some people in the chamber was uh, energy policy and where we on energy policy, getting the oil companies to, pr to produce more, saying that they're holding back. That's my word, not his. Uh, what's the response of the business community to that? What should be done right now, recognizing as the president himself, we need some oil for a while here. Yeah, well, the uh, I mean, the business community is united. We uh, we need to be on the uh, path to transitioning away from fossil fuels, but we need those fossil fuels not just for a decade, which is what the uh, the president referred to and elicited laughter from the Republican side, not just for a decade, but for decades to come, and we need those companies. Uh, many of whom are at the forefront of creating the technologies that will help us transition away from fossil fuel. Uh, we need to have government policies that are not designed to strangle them as rapidly as possible, but rather to, uh, to help give them the capital they need to make the transition. Uh, and that's where the disagreement from the business community is with a lot of Biden administration policy. We were strong supporters of uh, many of the climate measures that were contained in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, but also strong supporters of the measures in there and other measures that can be done to make sure that we are taking advantage of our own resources here in the United States, which can be produced much more cleanly than almost anywhere else in the world. Uh, which we're going to need to do for not just 10 years, but several decades to come. One of the things we did not hear about, at least I don't recall in the state of the address, was any talk about the overall level of regulation, the extent to which there is regulation, something that prior administrations, such as the Trump administration, did address. From the business's point of view, how do we get the right balance, both in terms of how much regulation and where the regulation comes? Because I suspect everyone agreed there has to be some regulation. 
Yeah, and uh, there's uh, you won't find a single member of the business roundtable saying, please put me in a completely unregulated environment. Uh, we do need to do, government does have a critical role to play in protecting the um, the health and safety of our population. And there's no resistance from the business community to that. Um, there is deep concern in many sectors of the U.S. business community about the tendency of, uh, of Biden appointees to overreach. And I'm referring now to some of the what's called the quasi-independent agencies like the SEC and the FTC, both in our view, uh, likely overreaching not just their statutory mandates, uh, but also what's sensible for the economy. Um, we, uh, we need an environment uh, where health and safety are protected and competition is protected, um, but to pr pursue a lot of social uh, goals through, through the guise of, of that kind of regulation has really gone overboard in the Biden administration. And uh, if anything, it, that may be the biggest point of friction between a lot of our business leaders um, and the uh, the executive branch we have in power today. We did hear in the State of the Union Address uh, talk about taxes, uh, both the so-called billionaires tax, but also a corporate minimum tax, tax on stock buybacks, and referring to those infamous 55 large corporations that pay no tax. What's the reaction of the Business Roundtable to that? Is there an issue here of the fairness of the tax code? No, <laughs> is the short <laughs> answer. Uh, I mean, they, uh, first, with respect to the uh, 55 companies that supposedly paid no tax, uh, many of them uh, didn't make profits uh, or, were, or were able to use past losses to reduce their profits for the current year. Uh, but the main reason why uh, a lot of companies ended up on that list is that they have been doing exactly what the tax code and what the government policy, and I should say Biden policy, expressly wants them to do, which is conduct R&D in the United States, invest in capital plant and equipment in, in the United States. And so they were, they've were they been able to reduce their tax liability by taking advantage of the incentives in the tax code to invest in the United States. We want them to do that and then to demonize them for uh, for having done that while demanding that they uh, that they stay competitive in the United States is is just a completely inconsistent and incoherent position. So, Josh, you've gone through a, a variety of possible differences of opinion, if I can put it that way, between the business community and the Biden administration. And I guess my question is, is that a failure to communicate or is it a true difference in policy? And, and I mean by that, you've served in the executive branch. Are there people in the executive branch who at least understand the arguments business is making? And I'll name a couple. Gina Raimondo has been in business. Uh, she did have her own venture company, capital firm. We now have Jeff Zients going in, who took a big company public. Do you have people in the administration that whether they agree with you or disagree with you, they understand the arguments they've been there? Yeah, uh, the administration has been short on, on those people, but you just mentioned two with whom the business community can, uh, can have a really good hearing and a fair dialogue. Uh, the problem with the Biden administration has never been a, 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 an unwillingness to uh, to listen. Uh, the dialogue has been civil. We've had uh, sharp disagreements on some issues, profound agreements on other issues. I, I don't want to characterize the relationship, at least of my organization, with the Biden administration as uniformly bad. Uh, but we've been often disappointed that the people with whom we've had our communication with uh, don't have the background, don't have the business experience to really appreciate what's likely to make business successful in the United States, which we all agree ought to be the goal. Uh, but I'm optimistic with uh, with folks like the two you just mentioned, Secretary Raimondo and Jeff Science in positions of responsibility, uh, that we that we will have those good channels of communication open. Okay, Josh, thank you so very much for joining us on Wall Street Week. That's jo that's Josh Bolton. He is the CEO of the Business Roundtable. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and we welcome back now our special contributor here at Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, one of the big events of this week was uh, Jay Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, speaking with our very own David Rubenstein in the Economic Club in Washington. And the markets came away from that saying, you know what, he didn't go as far as we thought he would. It's saying we've got to tighten more given those jobs numbers. Are we becoming complacent because there's talk on Wall Street now that there won't be any landing, whether it's soft or hard. Basically, we'll just keep going. I think the Fed understands that it doesn't understand because no one can know the future uh, with confidence. And I think that the Fed is determined to do what's necessary. That's certainly what I hope uh, is the case in a substantially uncertain environment. I think the consensus has become uh, substantially too complacent about inflation for a variety of reasons. First, let's be clear, even after the reductions we have seen, inflation today is at levels that would have been unimaginable uh, for inflation two years ago. And so we haven't come all the way down or got this fully under control. And in a way, uh, I guess one way to put it in Super Bowl week here is that it's easier to move the, move the ball down the field at midfield than it is when you're in the red zone. And we're getting closer to the red zone with respect to inflation. And so I think the gains in terms of further reduction are going to come harder. Second, I think there are a variety of bounce back uh, factors that we're going to have. Uh, you saw it in the uh, market wholesale used car prices, which look like they're going to be a positive contributor to inflation. You've seen some reversal on uh, gasoline prices. More broadly, you've seen a variety of prices that blipped way up uh, nine months or so ago. And now that's mean reverting. Now that's coming back to normal. Well, it's not always going to be going down. And when those become normal, that's going to be an increment to the underlying uh, inflation uh, figure. And so that, too, I think, is a cause for concern. Third, if you look at the variables that economists tend to think at, that you should look at to predict what's happening with inflation, we are an economy that's got relatively loose financial conditions now, given what's happened to markets. By some measures, financial conditions are looser than they were when all this tightening started. That's probably misleading. But it, we probably are back to somewhere where we were late last summer in terms of the degree of tightness in uh, financial uh, markets. And we've got that at a time when we still have a record level of vacancies relative to unemployment. So I think with that kind of picture, the prospect that we are not on a trajectory now where inflation is going to get to the target level, and therefore this tightening cycle is not just about one more, two more, three more, 25 basis point increases, but something more fundamental, that's a substantial probability uh, in uh, this environment. So I don't think it's a moment for any kind of uh, euphoria. Um, and I think there is some complacency that's setting in in many places. Larry, we heard from Chair Powell on Tuesday, and a few hours later, we heard from the President of the United States, Joe Biden, as he gave his State of the Union address to Congress. Uh, he did talk about some economic things, fair number in there, including some you and I have talked about, such as Buy America. What did you make of the economic part of President Biden's speech? Look, I think the most important thing to say about the President's uh, State of the Union was that it was probably the clearest, strongest exposition of his economic philosophy that he has delivered during his two years as president. I did worry that as I heard him talk and speak powerfully and I thought persuasively 
about the junk fee issues and the extra money people are paying for airline baggage or paying for overdraft uh, fees or a variety of those other junk fees. I like that because it was recognizing that people's incomes, people's spending power is what matters and that depends on how much they earn and it also depends on the prices they pay. I hope the administration is being very careful about that comprehensively. My guess would be that the extra taxes people are going to pay because projects are going to cost more because of Buy, uh, Buy America, the extra prices people pay because of tariffs that we put on in the name of create or maintain, in the name of creating American jobs, my guess is that those higher prices from things that we're doing through policy probably add more to consumer burdens than all the junk fees that the president spoke about. So I, I think we need to look very, very carefully at uh, those uh, policies. Larry, one thing that you and I have not talked about, I don't believe, is Israel and uh, B Benjamin Netanyahu's new government over in Israel. There are a lot of political and legal issues involved, but there are also some economic issues. As you know, a number of uh, U.S. economists, you, I don't think were involved, uh, wrote a letter really expressing concern about some of the pr pr proposed changes in the judiciary, what that could mean for the Israeli economy. I was a little surprised to see your name come up, actually, in the Times of Israel as having uh, talked to the Prime Minister, B Benjamin Netanyahu. What do you want to tell us about what they're doing over there. So, David, I don't, I don't talk about uh, my uh, conversations with government officials, as uh, you know, but I have been following this issue closely, and I think the temperature has to come down on uh, both sides. I think there is a case for, strong case, for judicial reform uh, in Israel. It's unusual by international standards for judges to be chosen by currently sitting judges. It's unusual for courts to be able to rule out legislation uh, simply by judging that it's unreasonable without having a constitution uh, to point to. On the other hand, it's very clear from the context of the way this is being done that it is feeling to a large number of people and a large number of people with the capacity to move their money in and out of Israel, particularly in the entrepreneurial community, that an overly rapid, not carefully done judicial reform could raise serious and profound questions about the rule of law. And that, it seems to me, could have quite serious adverse effects on uh, the Israeli economy. And, and finally, Larry, at the end of the week, we received word that Mr. Kazuo Ueda may well be appointed the next governor of the Bank of Japan. He is an academic economist, as I understand it. He has served in the past on the Bank of Japan Policy Board. Do you have thoughts about either Mr. Ueda or where the Bank of Japan needs to go next? You know, I think we can think of him as being uh, Japan's Ben Bernanke. He studied at MIT at about the same time that Ben did, with the same thesis advisor that Ben Bernanke had. He specialized in similar areas of monetary economics and has a soft-spoken academic way about him, but is also capable of being uh, decisive. And I think Japan has a very complicated issue ahead of it. I don't think it's going to be able to maintain yield control for an indefinite horizon. And he has big shoes to fill. Uh, I've known uh, Kuroda-san for more than uh, 30 years. He's an extraordinarily uh, capable, analytical, but also with a real measure of cunning uh, central banker. And he, he, will be, uh, he will be missed. But uh, knowing Mr. Ueda, I've got quite a bit of confidence in his ability to chart a course forward. 
Larry, thank you so very much. That's Larry Summers of Harvard, our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. Coming up on the road again, to New York, to Virginia, to Australia, but to Hong Kong? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. On the road again, the pandemic hit travel like nobody's business. During the pandemic, people stayed at home. They didn't go to movies. They didn't leave their homes. They didn't travel. As the world's economy shut down, so did the airlines and hotels. I think we've never seen an economy coming out of a shutdown like this at a moment like this when the world is in the kind of unusual and unique spot that it's in. But now things are coming back, with the airlines adding business as fast as they can. It's a billion pound bounce back that we did, and we achieved also the highest earnings ever in the, the last quarter in the company's history. And Airbnb reporting a big jump in demand. What we're seeing is hosts made record earnings this past summer. Given the uptick in tourism, it's no surprise that governments are back in the business of luring visitors. New York urges visitors to come check out the slopes. There's something for everyone in New York State. Virginia urges us to come back to Williamsburg. So and even Australia is getting in on the act with a campaign featuring Hollywood stars Will Arnett and Rose Byrne, or at least computer animated versions of them. There's nothing like Australia. Special, huh? But perhaps the most remarkable of these campaigns is Hello Hong Kong, complete with offers of 500,000 free airline tickets. See you in Hong Kong. Which is badly needed, given the reported plummet in tourist visas to Hong Kong from a pre-pandemic high of 56 million to reported 100,000 in 2022. Though putting 47 prominent Hong Kong citizens on trial for national security violations isn't likely to help that situation much. One thing is for sure. Secretary of State Blinken won't be traveling to Hong Kong. He had to cancel his China trip because of that pesky spy balloon. We concluded that conditions were not conducive for a constructive visit at this time. And there is one legendary football player who will not be traveling to Phoenix for the Super Bowl. Though Tom Brady's decision to retire managed to drive up the price of beachfront property, or at least the beach he was sitting on when he made his announcement. I'm retiring for good. With reports that a jar of sand from that beach was bid up to almost $100,000 on eBay at one point. And even if Mr. Brady doesn't make it back to the Super Bowl, he can always head to Orlando. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.